episode 24. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architectos. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we talk about making more money as an architect so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on doing what you love. In today's episode, we're going to talk about one thing, how architects can get more of the right kind of clients and get out of the commodity rat race by raising fees. Also, if you'd like to get more information beyond this interview about how you can raise your fees and set up a system that will get you a steady flow of clients, just like Mona did in our last interview for your architecture firm, today's guest is going to be holding a free webinar on October 9th, and kindly he's extended the invitation to the audience of Business of Architecture to attend that webinar, and you can reserve your spot by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October, so that's a special page that I set up for listeners of this podcast. It's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October to reserve your spot for the October 9th webinar. And without further ado, here's our show. Hello, Agile Architects, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture. Today we have the privilege of having Richard Petrie with us. He is a New Zealander, and he's actually the second New Zealander to be on our show, which is pretty exciting. If you remember, a couple weeks ago we had Mona Quinn on the show, and she's a she is New Zealand's leading character home architect. She was telling us how in four months... She booked her firm solid and was able to raise her prices as a residential architect. Now, at the time, she mentioned that she worked with a marketing consultant, and she was kind enough to share that his name is Richard Petrie, and I rounded him up, and here he is on the show today. So, Richard, welcome to the business of architecture. Yeah, thank you very much, Enoch, and I'm delighted to be here and, uh, and, and be able to provide some information, hopefully, to your listeners. So, well, it sounds like you've got some, some architects all around the world. Um, so, yeah, no, really excited to be here and uh, looking forward to it. Excellent, excellent. Yes, our, our audience does spread around the world. And although they're predominantly in the United States because this is, you know, one of the largest English-speaking countries, uh, as you know, Richard, the last couple of years for architects have been extremely difficult. The competition has been very fierce. And some of the strategies that worked in the past seem not to be working as well. For instance, the word of mouth referrals. Right. So you help professional services sell their services. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't just work with architects. Um, I work with people selling high-priced professional services. Um, and the, 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 that, that's an advantage then because... What you can learn from various industries, and pretty much they're very similar. Consulting, selling high-priced consulting is not too dissimilar, whether it's an accountant or a lawyer or an architect. The process is reasonably the same, or it can be. But what, what I get to see, I guess, is working across a whole lot of different industries, is you get to see certain things that different industries are doing, and I can steal it from lawyers and put it into architects. And, and it works just as well, but because when you find your... Um, Working within an industry, what, what most people do, let's say architects, is they look at what other architects in their market are doing, and then they just sort of copy it, and they might be 10% plus or minus the same as everyone else, and that's when you start making yourself invisible. So if it's tough times, you, you've actually got to be different from everyone else. Being plus or minus 10% isn't enough. But but if you look to other industries, which I guess I'm fortunate enough to do, I can look at across you know 20 different types of industries, and I can steal really good bits and then put them all together, and it works seems to work just as well for architects as it does for the people over here. So um, once again, not sure what your question was, but that's the answer. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, let's take a typical. Let's just put a a scenario out here. I'm an architect, and I'm excellent at what I do. I've worked for the past 30 years doing architecture. I'm an expert in my field, and yet a lot of architects find themselves in this position, and yet they're struggling to find work. Yep. So, Richard, what can you what can you know from – how can you help this person in your experience? What are they doing wrong? I think that they're, they're, they're basing it off a wrong assumption, and the assumption is that if I'm good at what I do, if I'm the best in my market at what I do, therefore people will come to me. And that's a mistake, and it's a mistake um, – for two reasons. It, it, just to give you a couple of examples, have a think about you know who makes the most money selling hamburgers. 
right? And we'd probably say McDonald's. Okay, well, are they the best burgers? Well, probably not, right? Probably not. Um, who makes the most money selling pizzas? Maybe it's Domino's or Pizza Hut or, you know, one of those big, big, um, they're all American, these players. You notice all the fast food is, you know, America owns it. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, that was a cheap shot, there. Richard. Yeah. Well, you guys won the America's Cup, and we're still a bit bitter about that, actually. So um, um, I speak to Eric the other day while it was on, but the, um, yeah, so so you might say Microsoft, they pro they might make the most money, or Oracle. Well, are they, are they the best software? Arguably, Microsoft is not the best software, but they make the best money. So if being the best doesn't make you rich, what does? And I think in a lot of cases, I mean, being the best is part of it, but it's not going to make you rich on its own. Being the best marketer does. The burgers that McDonald's make is sort of okay, and, you know, the Pizza Hut and maybe Microsoft, it's okay, it's got a lot of bugs in it, but being the best marketer is what's going to make you rich. And unfortunately, and I'll tell you why I think this is the case, and that is that, that, that your, your clients or your market or your buyers, they don't know that you're the best architect in your field because we're not qualified to be able to tell whether you're any good or not. We can look at a house and say whether we like it or not, but, you know, I'm a typical buyer. We bought some, I guess, some architectural service a couple of years ago. Well, how do we, how do we buy our architect, you know? Well, here's how we did it. We didn't go around and, and, into the colleges and the universities and try and check everybody's grades to see, see who had the highest marks. We didn't go to the architecture, I don't know, the architecture institute or the architecture magazines to try and find out who, who's rated number one, two, and three and then pick the best one. We didn't do that. How did we do it? And this is probably how most of your, you know, your listeners' clients do it, is we spoke to someone else who used an architect and said, what were they like? And they said, oh, yeah, no, they're really good, you know, and we, we like the look of their work. But they're not qualified to give an opinion on how good that architect is. Neither are we, you know. None of us are. You know, we're taking advice from someone's wife who has no idea about architecture. They just like, you know, we like it. It might not have been a very good design. It was just we think we like it. So there you go. So people are very poor at determining whether you're good or not. So if you're good, unfortunately, half the time your market doesn't understand it or doesn't appreciate it. Okay. But they so, do understand marketing. And there we go. So how would someone who has these skills, how do they communicate that to their client? Yeah, well, that's a... The, yeah, or well, probably their market, so that, so that their market get, gets um, gravitated towards them. How do, you, how do you say you're good? Well, you've got to look at how do people recognize... Um, um, people who are up the tree, or, or you know, particularly if you want to sell premium priced architecture services, say, let's take that as an example. So, how would I know someone was a really good architect? Well, the only way I can do it, because I'm not qualified to do it, and I don't know anyone who is, and, and the friends who used an architect, they're not qualified to tell me either. The only ways I can do it is things like, and here's how it's done it's all superficial stuff. I look at the price they're charging, right? If they're more expensive, I sort of have to assume they're better, right? If I see that they've been written about in an article in my local newspaper or magazine, then I assume that they must be higher up the pecking order and they're better, and therefore I expect to pay a higher price. If they've been interviewed um, somewhere, then my assumption is that therefore they must be good. Um, if they've written a book, you know, and, and nowadays you can write a book, you just... You know, you, you go to your local library, you get an ISDN number, you download a barcode, and all of a sudden you're an author. If I see they've written a book about it, well, do I want to deal with the architect who's putting out pamphlets with his price in it, or do I want to deal with the architect who's written the book on the subject? Well, I want to deal with the guy who's written the book. So I call these things sort of symbols of power. Right? I'm not qualified to judge whether someone's good or not, but I know that if someone's more expensive, they've written a book, they've been in the newspaper, they provide seminars or workshops or they provide educational material, I have to assume that they're good. Excellent. So let's, you know, this is probably sounding a little overwhelming, writing a book and getting in newspapers. That's probably a little bit farther down the track. How would you start out with an architect who comes to you and says, Richard, I just, I really need some help. I, I'm at the point where I need some new clients in. What can you do for me? Okay, so some, some quick little strategies. By the way, those things out, they might sound it, but 
they're not actually that hard to do. You know, it's quite easy to do a press release and and, and all this type. Writing a book is, um, you don't have to have it published by anyone else. You can, you, you know, you just have to get an ISDN number from a, you know, in New Zealand it's the National Library. They'll give you one and you just put that on the back of the book. So those things actually aren't as intimidating as they sound. They probably do sound intimidating, but they're not. How would I, um, in terms of going out and getting clients, say, this week, what would I tell people to do? Number one, I'd, I'd hope they had a database of all the people that they'd talk to, um, either clients and one database of clients and one database of non-clients or, or people who didn't buy, okay? And then what I'd probably do is rather than like write a letter and say, hey, you know, I'm an architect and you didn't buy off me, I'd put together a newsletter, a good old-fashioned hard copy newsletter, and it might only be you know, um, a double-sided sheet of paper, and I'd create a little newsletter, right? It's not a selling tool. It's more of an education tool, what Richard's up to, um, some tips, some handy hints, and I'd look in that newsletter, I'd look to try and provide some education because, like I said before, if it looks like you're educating people, then it looks like you're more, you know, people who educate the market own the market. So I'd do a newsletter. I would send it to my past clients, and I would send it to people who didn't buy from me. And I would I would have a list of, say, try and find a list of 20 people who I think could be good referral sources. And then I would send this newsletter to them every single month. And I'd probably have an offer in there, um, somewhere in the newsletter, and maybe even a, 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 you know, a voucher that comes with the newsletter, um, inviting people to call me up to have a, a one-hour session if they're, if they're thinking about doing their architecture, then, then you know, they're welcome to book me for an hour. Okay. It's cheap. It's cheap. It's, it's, you know, you're going back to the people who already know you, um, and I think it would be one of the easiest things to do and one of the best things to do, the old-fashioned newsletter. Excellent. So the, just uh, to summarize, just reach out to your previous clients, either people that already bought or people yep. who didn't buy. Yes, and, and reestablish those connections. Yep, because I, I would see your 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 um your past clients as almost like your unpaid sales force, and and they're going to be because they'll be great. Ref, you know, well, they could be great referrers if if they were kept. You know, you need to stay in touch with them. You can't afford to forget them. So yeah. treat them as, as potential referral sources. And, and stay in touch with them and give them plenty of opportunities to refer you. Well, I think now's a good time to remind our audience that if they'd like to know more about working with you, Richard, they can attend the free webinar on October 9th where you will be talking about how architects can identify the gaps in their lead generation, follow-up, and sales methods, and develop their own personal complete action plan that could totally remake their business. Now, anyone who attends that webinar on October 9th will also be eligible for a free personal one-on-one -on -one strategy session with Richard to help work out their plan. And that's, he's very generous in offering that to um, the people who will be attending that webinar. So if you'd like to take it to the next level and know how you specifically can get more of the right clients and apply these principles in your business, pause this right now and go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October to reserve your spot. So that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October spelled out. Okay, I'm waiting. I'll pause here for a second so you can reserve your spot. Okay, let's go on. So now I want to transition a little bit, Richard, and talk about the psychology of marketing and selling. One thing Mona said during her interview was that she's been able to raise her prices. Could you talk a little bit about the psychology of working with clients and raising the price point? Okay. This this might seem um, strange, and I, I know um, most people have a hard time with this one. But whether it's whether it was Mona, we raised her prices about twenty percent to see if it made any difference, and it didn't. And and you might you know people might say, oh, it's a different economy in New Zealand. It's still been pretty tough here, but I don't think as bad as the US. And then we raised in ten percent again, and it didn't seem to make. It. In fact, it attracted more people. Because I think we went from being, you know, she was middle of the road priced to being slightly more high priced. And so that, it didn't make any difference. We didn't even change any marketing. We just put the price up. It didn't seem to make any difference. But the second thing we did, you might find interesting, is instead of being a general architect, we said, what are the things that you do really well on? Who are the type of clients 
who maybe have more money or you do a better job for or you like working with. And in New Zealand, there's, there's a type of thing called character homes. So they're the old villas. Um, they were built around, you know, the turn of the century, um, the last one, or the previous one. And, and we said, that, how about you being a specialist a character home architect? Okay, so rather than being, you know, I guess the, the analogy would be like being a, a, a GP, a doctor, a general practitioner who sees all sorts of things. Now, if, if he, it's a guy, if he, he was to go away on holiday, what would happen? Well, you'd, you'd get a, a locum come in and, and you'd be replaceable, right? But if you're talking about the brain surgeon, someone who's a specialist in a very narrow niche, if the brain surgeon goes on holiday, all the appointments have to stop because he's the only one or she's the only one who can do it. So what we want to do is sort of replicate that and turn Mona into a bit of a, more of a specialist. And, and as soon as that happens, as long as you've picked the right thing to be a specialist in, price expectations go up. You start attracting people who want specialists rather than generalists. And it's very easy to put your price up. Um, and also, people people are a lot more respectful of a profession of a specialist. I don't know if you noticed. If you go to a you know a GP, you might say, "Well, I, he diagnoses you with something." You say, "Well, I might go get a second opinion." But if you go to a specialist, the levels of compliance goes massively up for specialists. People do what they're told when they go to the brain surgeon. He says, "You've got to do this and this and this." GP, people tend not to do what they're told. Specialists, they do. Um, so I think if, you know, everyone listening on this call uh, or this, or this um, you know, podcast, if you have a think about if you were to become a specialist in an area, you know, what's something you do where you provide a unique service or you, you provide something which other people either can't specialize in or they don't talk about specializing in what's an area that you could own that if you owned that that small little area and and you owned it you know less is more would would generate a whole lot more money for you and, and uh, sorry to go on but but one way of doing that if you look back over all your clients and think about the jobs you've done and the type of work you've done was there a particular 20 percent of the jobs you've done which were really profitable or you maybe really enjoyed, or um, you were able to achieve things um, that another architect wouldn't have been able to achieve, which provided extreme value for your clients, and that that might give you a hint as to the area you might try and go and specialize in. Excellent. So we we spe you have the architect specialize in something. You help them identify that, and you gave the example of looking back over past jobs and finding out which ones were profitable and and which ones were enjoyable and choosing. Then after you've determined what you're going to specialize in, where does where do we go from there, generally uh, speaking? Yeah, okay. I'll give you a bit of a process, actually. I'll, I'll give, can I give you an analogy? Because I'll, I'll give you the whole process here, because this will be easier. I, uh, if, you, if you imagine marketing as... I went to university for um, four years. I was at university, and you know one of the things I majored in was, was marketing. And ironically, after four years of studying marketing, I came out with no idea how to sell anything. You know, ironically, you know, <laughs> right? So, so what I'm going to give you is a bit of a, a bit of a, an analogy um, using fish. And I think if I was given this, it, this is more useful than my four years studying marketing at university. <laughs> okay. So the analogy with fish is that if you're going out to catch fish, there's a lot of fish in the sea, isn't there? There's there's some really good fish, and there's a, there's a type of fish down here. I don't know if you have it up, up um, in the Atlantic, but blue cod. There's blue cod, which is great-tasting fish. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got mud eels and um, sharks and other types of fish which don't taste so good. So if I was a fisherman, first thing I'd want to do is I'd say, right, what are the type of fish I want to catch? Because there's a lot of fish in the sea, right? But a lot of the fish don't taste very good. So I'd say, in my case down here, I want blue cod. That's the best fish. Now, you know, it's a small subset, but it's the best fish, and it's, it's great. So number one, I want to target them. Number two, I'm going to have to think about where do the blue cod swim, because they don't swim everywhere. Okay? If I was just to drop a line into the ocean, I wouldn't catch one. right? And that would be the same as just dropping an ad out into the wide market about I'm an architect. 
I'm probably not going to catch the, the best dream type of client I'm after because it's just like dropping a, a hook into the water. It's too, it's too big. What I know about blue cod is they tend to swim in little pods or little schools, but they don't, they don't tend to move more than 100 metres or 100 yards from where they were born. They tend to, you know, they tend to swim in little pods. So you've got the whole ocean, you've got these little fishing spots, well, fishing spots, the fish don't call them fishing spots, they call them <laughs> where we live, but they live, <laughs> little, they live in pockets, and you've got to think, these, these little, the perfect fish for me, they live in pockets in certain places. So I've got to find out whereabouts these little pockets are to even have a chance, okay? So to bring it back to a, you know, who's my dream client, who's my blue cod, if I just go general, I'm probably not going to find them. I've got to find out where these dream clients hang out and where they where they live. So find out where they swim, number two. And of course I could have the best, you know, I could be the best fisherman in the world, but if I'm dropping my bait in the middle of the ocean, I'm not going to catch anything. It doesn't really matter how good my marketing is. I'm in the wrong place. They're not there. Number three, I've got to understand how they think. Okay, I've got to understand what goes through their heads, what sort of bait they're going to they're gonna like, you know, are they, do they swim miles from home or do they stay in little pods? So I have to understand how they think. And in a marketing point of view, I need to, if I'm going to target a, a narrow sort of band of customers, I need to understand how these people think. What are their fears? What are their concerns? What are their preconceptions or how are they predisposed? How do they buy? These, these, because these people will buy differently than these ones. So how do these people buy? So number one, select your target of the type of fish you're after. Number two, make sure, try and find out where they swim. If you can't understand that, then you might have to pick another fish, but find out where they swim. Number three, understand how they think. Okay, number four, if I was a fisherman, I would have to select the right bait. Okay, blue cod will eat certain type of fish, the sharks will eat something else, the mud eels will eat something else. So in a marking point of view, there's certain information or there's certain offers or there's certain ways of talking that your top, you know, the top 10% of your market are going to resonate with. Not everyone will, but, but those ones will. We're only after the best fish. So select the best bait. Is this making sense? It <laughs> was a bit too Absolutely good? no. Yes. Good. Good. Okay, so now we've got the bait. Now the bait could be some sort of, is, is, is um, you know, what sort of thing are you going to get? attract them to you, whether it's an offer about, you know, maybe it's discounting, I don't think it should be, but maybe it's discounting, maybe it's information, you run a seminar, or maybe it's, right, number five is you've got to select the right hook, okay, so when you're fishing, if you've got the wrong hook, you may attract the fish with your bait, but you're not snaring them because the hook's too big or the hook's too small, so the hook in, our, in this case would be the offer, Okay, it's not just enough to have the bait. You've got to have the right offer to hook them. <laughs> um, and an offer, an offer usually, in the case of what the architects might find useful, is is some sort of call to action where they have to they get something in return for giving over their contact details. So the offer is, I don't know, um, fill out this, fill out your email address or contact details, and we'll send you this free report that outlines how to hire an architect, maybe, for, for upmarket homes in the Chicago region. Quite niche. Um, and just slow me down if I'm, if I'm not making sense, if I'm getting too, uh, too fishy. So you've got to have the right offer. Number six, you've got to have a line to reel them in. So it's all very well to, to get the fish coming to your bait, you hook them, you get their contact details, or you get them to call you, now you've got to be able to reel them in because there's no point just hooking them and leaving them out of the water. You've got to have a line to get them on board your boat. And the, the analogy with that is your follow-up material. So once they've initially engaged with you somehow, you've then got to have a way to haul them back in. And before we sort of went online, um, Enoch was talking about having gone to a conference and all the follow-up sequences that, that these, these guys were, were teaching about, you know, wheeling, wheeling people in because... Because, you know, just like trying to date a woman, um, you're not going to get them, you're not going to get it married on the first date. It's going to be a series of small escalating steps, yep. um, which is, which is the, you know, it's almost the, like fishermen, slowly, slowly reeling them in and, and getting them on board the boat. 
Number seven, so you've got to have a line, you've got to have a follow-up process. Number seven is once you get them on board your boat, if you're really serious about having lots of blue cod, you'd probably, you'd probably breed them and you'd put them in a little pool. You'd have a, a man blue cod and a, a lady blue cod and you'd let them have babies. So the analogy would, for that would be, um, you know, you'd be breeding them, which is sort of like getting referrals which is massively important for, for architects, I think, is, is that referral thing. So, so number one, select exactly who you want to deal with, and it's not going to be your whole market. It might only be 10% of all the type of jobs you could do, but pick the, the most profitable or the stuff you like doing. Two, find out where those people are likely to be, how you can reach them, what magazines they read, maybe what, what neighbourhoods they live in, maybe um, find out where they swim. Three, understand how they th how they think and what their problems are and how they how these people, the top ten percent, like to buy architecture services. Four, work out some sort of bait that that's going to get them to approach you and and start a conversation. Five, make sure there's an offer to um, to get their name and contact details and return for this information or whatever it is you provide. Six, make sure you have a follow up system and, and so you can reel them in. And seven, have a referral process where you can get introduced to their to their mates. Because I actually find the top ten percent of um, people who spend the most money or the best type of clients, um, they're very big on referrals, or they're very big on like me asking. You know, we, we went to our friend who had architecture services done, and, and and we based it on the feedback we had from a lady who was completely unqualified to, to give us any sort of advice on it and we were unqualified to take it. So referrals is massive once they're on board. So hopefully that, that sort of made a little bit of sense at a, at a high Yeah, level. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously it's a little too much to go over every step in detail during, during this particular show, but I do want to hone in on number three okay. because I find that number three is a point – at which many people who try to do marketing stumble. You yep. know, and number three, once again, is to understand what your clients want. Yep. I find that a lot of architects or people in general selling services, you know, as an architect, I would say, okay, my client wants a permit. They want to get their building built. They want to get it done quickly. They might even want to beat me down on my fees. They might want cheaper fees. Is that, what what do you is that what we're talking about here by understanding what your client wants or is there something deeper? I think there's something a bit deeper, and I think um, it makes it very hard to sell if you if you're sort of if, if you're stuck at the area that they just want a permit, you know, or they just you know that people usually want more than that. So you got to, it, it starts with understanding who the fish are first, and if you're just trying to get people who just want a permit and just want a building done as cheap as possible, that is a type of fish, but that might be a mud eel. And it may be that, that that's a market. You know, if price is their number one driver, you might say, well, I, I don't really want to deal with those people. Okay? I'm too good an architect. I can provide too much value to people who value it for me to deal with that type of thing. There'd be a lot of people, and there'd be a lot of people, if you're finding you're getting beaten on price and all that type of stuff, well, maybe they're the wrong fish, okay? And I think, you know, for most of the people listening to this, their best fish are only probably going to represent 10% of all the potential people that they could provide architecture services to, maybe 10 or 20%. So, you know, before you understand how they think, if, if, you're, if you're too broad, then all the different fish think slightly differently. So I'd be honing it down to who is the narrow bound that I want. And then, and then you're in a position to make generalizations about, you know, a, a narrower way, range. So some of the questions you might ask is, can you give me an example of, of maybe a niche that might be a really good niche to, 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 to specialize down to? And then, then we can take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lot of people listen to this show that customize, they do custom homes. So right. a residential architect who's working with people who do custom homes. Okay. Let's talk about that. You know, for my, my – so I'm going to play the role. Let's do a role play here. We can say I'm the architect and I do custom homes. And yep. the clients that come to me, you know, they have an idea of what they want in terms of their plans. So I sit them down and I talk them through the design process and I tell them about the past projects I've done. I show them pictures of my projects. Yep. How would you approach that? that? Would you approach it differently or how would you do that? 
Yeah, well, 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 that's just a sort of an anyone that turns up. That could be any fish that ends up on your line. So how I'd approach it is say, okay, I don't just want anyone. Maybe I want people who want to build a residential home, but they want to build something special. These people are quite wealthy. Price is not an object. They want a design which impress their neighbours. These are the type of fish I'm after. So does that make sense? Yeah, so you're with this you're narrowing down to the maybe say upper income brackets or people to whom image is important. Yeah, you know, and, and to keep it very superficial and, and, and maybe overly simplistic, I want to deal with the top 10% of the market, the people, because the 80-20 principle, architects are smart people, they know the 80-20 principle. The 80-20 principle says that 20% of anything equals 80% of something else. So if we were to apply that to say architecture services, Let's say the market was people building residential homes. 20% of the people spending money with architects to build residential, uh, to, to design residential homes. If the if the 80-20 principle is true, and we know it is pretty much everywhere, that that top 20% is spending 80% of the money, right? Which means that 80% of the people who are getting plans and designs done by architects are spending probably 20% of the money, right? So if I was just to take on board anyone who, who I came across, they're probably going to be within the 80% who spend 20% of the money. So I might just say, as a, as, a, as a very crude example, I want to deal with people who are in the top, you know, the top 10% of income earners or in, in my region. I want to deal with people who only want to build special design houses for whom price is not an object. What they want is something special. That's a much smaller niche for me to focus on. These people do think differently. These people are very wealthy people. Um, they don't think the same way as these people over here. So then I'd say, okay, how do these people think? Let's say we're dealing with people who want to spend, I don't know, they want to do a, re you guys, we call it renovation, but I think you call it remodeling, but maybe they want to do something for, five, you know, maybe a million dollars or five hundred thousand um, dollars. Okay, so I want to say, okay, what sort of jobs do they have? When they're buying this type of service, you know, what are they looking for? You know, how, how do they work out who to trust? Um, what are their fears about getting their house remodeled or, or renovated? What fears do they have? Because it might be different from the guy who's just trying to get the cheapest job he can. His fear is, you know, keeping it under under $100,000. This person might be might be more worried about, what the neighbours will think, you know, will it be better than the guy down the road? It's a different psyche. But I, I, I want to know that because if I'm going to create a message, I want to resonate with these people and probably even put these people off because these people will just, I won't say they'll waste my time, but if, I, if I'm going to specialise in dealing with these people, I need to have something which is cons everything I do is consistent with what these people want. I don't, I don't want to be all things to all people. That will make me poor. I need to be the best option for these people. So I need to understand my market and my clients, and I need to provide a service which specifically tailors that covers the fears that they have and, and, and operates and deals the way they want to be treated because it's not going to be the same as these ones. So um, it's, a, it's really just a series of questions. You know, what are they scared of? How do they like to buy? Who do they take advice from, you know? How do they? Who, who 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 influences them? What magazines do they read? Do they read House and Garden, or you know, do we need to try and get ourselves in there somehow? Um, what what neighbourhoods do they live in? You know, we can reach them because we know that if I want to deal with these people, you don't have to be super rich yourself to sell to these people, but you just have to know how they think and what they want. Um, and if you're only targeting these people, it's not too hard. You know, if you're trying to target these people and be make everybody happy, then that's hard, you know. So Absolutely. How would you, can you give me an example of how you might target one of these groups? You said you, you say you know, for instance, what neighborhood they might live in. How might an architect go about targeting one of these niche markets? Yeah. Just one example. Okay, I'll give you one example. I had a, a builder and we were talking about um, how does he get access to, um, you know, who, who does he want? He want, he want to build for people who want to sort of upmarket renovations. So great, how can we reach these people? We talked about magazines and newspapers. And then we, we sat there and thought, hang on, this is, this is ridiculous. We know where they live, right? 
you know, we know the suburbs that we want to be dealing with. Why don't we just go to the suburb? And we thought, okay, we know where they live, so we can we can we can get them to read our stuff because we can we know where their letterboxes are. So one thing we just we decided to do this. We said, let's create. Initially, we thought let's create a let's get an ad in the um, usually they over here they have sort of resident rate payers associations or you know the, they have an association for the neighbourhood. Let's see if we can get an ad or an article in the local community newspaper that they have. And then we thought, hang on, that's a bit silly because that's hard work and sometimes they'll charge you and they'll, you don't know in the next publication is. Why don't we create our own little newsletter? We'll call, you know, one of the suburbs here that's quite well is called Roseneath. Why don't we create the Roseneath Community Newsletter, right? Make it look like it's, you know, it's, it's, we're not saying it's by anyone, it's by us. Let's create the Roseneath Community Newsletter. Let's write up a little newsletter about things that are happening in the area. And we'll always have an article by us about us and what we're doing, and we'll always have a little, you know, um, a little offer in there about renovations and things like that, because these people do like to do it. And let's stick it in their letterbox every month. Um, you know, and, and when they read it, they sort of think it's a community thing. So when they read the article about us, it's almost like um, they think it's been written by the community news team, whoever that is, which, which happens to be our sales department, you know. <laughs> But it's just useful little tips about the neighbourhood. Yeah, so, so if you're an architect, I think you could even suburb. Great, great. Well, that's that's an excellent example. Thanks for being specific on that, Richard. Now, what are some mistakes? I know we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the interview, but what are, what are some of the mistakes that you see people selling professional services making? Well, number one, and I sort of talked about it before, but, but trying to be all things to all people. So, man, if I was an architect... It's too hard to be all things to all people because you you, you must pick pick your battles and try and win one you know win one fight. There's a book called yeah. um, Al Rees wrote it and it's called something like the Twenty One Immutable Laws of Marketing and the concept he talks about is that the marketplace is like a battlefield and there's a whole lot of little hills on this battlefield and your job is to own one of the hills. You know your little army. You, and if you're big, you might be able to own two or three if you're lucky, but you can't fight the battle on ten different fronts. So you've sort of got to pick the little hill you want to win and then get yourself to the top and then fight everyone off that little hill. Now, if you're a small architect, probably like a lot of people here are, you, you, pick, your, you pick your battle and you try and win and be the specialist or the expert for that hill and own that hill. So you know, I think that's the biggest one is just don't try and be all things to all people. Um, be the very best option for one category of people. Because Excellent. I'll come to you. Excellent, excellent. So that answers the question about the top mistake you see people making with per selling professional services. Now, we're coming up to the end of our interview, so maybe we want to just try to think about some takeaways and wrap it up in terms of, of marketing. Um, I want to touch on what are some things that architects might do, Richard, to get more leads, because more really that, that's what a lot of people are wondering. How can I get more clients? In addition to what you've already talked about, how would you approach that? I talked about doing a newsletter to all the people you've been in contact with, because I think referrals is big, right? Referrals okay. is massive for architects, and, and as it is for a lot of professional services. So uh, a good old-fashioned hard copy newsletter is a really good idea. So to your past customers, to your current customers, to, to other complementary type, maybe builders and whoever you think are in a position to be able to refer to you, that would yeah. be... What, what, kind of, what kind of material would be in this newsletter? Um, there'd be a mixture of um, education um, plus stuff about you. As much as most people don't want to talk about themselves, they've got to get to know who you are, um, um, what you're up to, um, Plus, they've got to know that you're an expert and you specialise. So the fact you know that you specialise in this type of work, um, tips on how to hire an architect, the questions you should be asking them, the answers maybe that they should be giving you. Yeah. <laughs> no? that, that, that can be a really good one. But a mixture of non-relevant stuff and relevant stuff. So the relevant stuff demonstrates what an expert you are, and the non-relevant stuff gets them to know, like, and trust you. Okay. Excellent. So per, be a resource for the people, for your, your prospects. Uh, you mentioned doing a newsletter. What yep. other are some lead generation sources? 
Uh, uh, well, I think I think people need to have a wee look at AdWords, so that's probably something that, that you can help them with. I think they should contact you and, 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 and try and get some help there. You know, Google AdWords work well, or maybe Facebook for some people. I, I don't know about Facebook, but um, certainly the newsletters, I think. I think flyers or newsletters into, into the neighbourhoods that they want to target is it? You know, I mean, we can put ads in the paper, but I mean, we don't know if they're going to read it. But if we if we stick something in their letterbox, and it's the, why wouldn't we go direct? Um, I think speaking is always a good one. If you can partner up with a real estate agent, um, or a valuer, or a um, you know someone in your industry who can who can put on a little workshop, and you can do a workshop on renovations and you know architecture ideas, that's great. You'll always pick up three or four leads if you've got 20 or 30 people in a room, you'll pick up, you know, because um, you're an expert. And another one is just make available, be the educator for your market. So create little short one-page cheat sheets or um, a little booklet or something and make sure that's available in the market that, for people to grab because there's a good saying, whoever educates the market owns the market. So as soon as anyone starts reading any material you've produced which is educational, once again, they start perceiving you as being up here. So, in summary, uh, I think a bit of AdWords, I think a bit of um, um, newsletters to your clients and things like that. I think a newsletter within the niche you want to operate in. I mean, I, I think if you just did that, that would probably be enough. You'd be Excellent. Off that one. Excellent. Yeah. So just to, to, to reiterate what Richard was saying, for people that don't know AdWords, he's referring to Google AdWords, which is a form of online advertising, and there are other sources, so paid online advertising was what, what Richard, because some people might not know what AdWords are. So Richard, it has been a wonderful pleasure to have you on the show. Lots of lots of excellent information. It's 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 great to get someone on here who specializes in marketing because you approach the subject with a very different lens than we do oftentimes as architects. Right. So I know we've talked a lot, we've talked about a lot of different points today. What's one or two takeaways that you'd like to share with us as we as we end our conversation today? Wow, and I'm sorry, I've probably I've, I've just gone on and gone on, and uh, ho you know, hopefully people pick one or two things out. But I, I just think specialize. Don't don't be a generalist. I'm saying that again. Um, you educate people. So specialize, educate people, because whoever educates the market owns the market, and connect with. Connect with sources who are likely to refer you. Connect with the – of all the people you deal with, there's, there's probably 10 people who you could connect with that if they liked you and they referred people to you, maybe they're builders or maybe they're you, – you'd have all the work you could possibly handle. So to make a list of the people who can refer work to you and make sure your new monthly newsletter is going to them every month and make sure you're staying in touch with those people. Um, because they can pass you leads. For every lead you get, uh, I know most of the people here probably get a lot of referrals, but for every referral you get, I guarantee there's probably, you know, from a person, I guarantee there's probably another five or six referrals they could be passing you that they haven't. You know? So if half the business is coming from referrals, I was just going to say, can I give you a quick um, referral? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, one of the easiest referral strategies is just, a, you know, the newsletter is one, but just, just ask people. And if someone says, I'm, I, I think I know someone who's doing something, you know, rather than say, can I have their name and number, just you can say, look, can you introduce us? Can you send an email to them and me saying, hey, you know, um, Richard uh, Enix, uh, an architect, and he does a great job, and, you know, I know you're talking about it, so I'd just like to introduce you and Enoch. Um, Bob is, 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 is owns a house in my area. He's a friend of mine, and you know he's, he's thinking about architecture. It might be early days, but I think you two should have a chat at some stage. I'll leave it up to you guys to connect. So just a little introductory email is an easy thing to ask people to do. You can then follow up, and if they want to do something, they, they can or, or, or not. But um, the roads, it's not a cold call anymore. Excellent. Well, thank you, Richard, for taking the time for joining us on the business of architecture. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. And in closing, don't forget to reserve your seat on the webinar with Richard that he will be hosting on October 9th, where he will tell you more about how you can raise your fees and attract the profitable clients that we all love to work with. 
So the link for that is businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October. That's once again, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October. And once again, those who attend that webinar will be getting, will be eligible for a free one-on-one -on -one strategy session with Richard to talk about their own personal business. So space is limited and be sure to reserve your spot today. And that link is businessofarchitecture.com forward slash October. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway. <laughs>